modal logic is probably the greatest, the most fun form of logic out there. This is a hill I'm willing to die on. You might disagree with me, but you are wrong. But what is modal logic? What is it for? What does it look like? And what can we do with it? Let's find out. everyone, welcome to Attic Philosophy. On this channel we are talking about all aspects of philosophy, right from metaphysics through to applied social issues. Here we've got a series of videos introducing the basic concepts of logic. In this video we are going to start looking at modal logic. I'm going to take you through a really super quick intro to modal logic, what it is, what it's for, what you can do with it, what it looks like. And then in subsequent videos, we're going to go into more detail on what it means and how we do things with it and all that kind of stuff. If you're finding these videos useful, exciting, if they are the reason you get up in the morning, yeah, come on, Mark. Why don't you consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell icon and get all the updates. Okay, so modal logic. What is modal logic? What's it for? So modal logic is the logic that includes modalities. So a, a prime example of a modality is saying it's possible that. Okay, so modifying a sentence rather than saying the sentence is true or that it's false, like we have been doing so far, to saying that it's possible. Okay, it's possibly true. It's possibly false. So possible, that's one modality. Another modality related is it's necessary. So we can say of a sentence that it's necessarily true or it's necessarily false. So the reason we're calling these modalities rather than connectives like we had and or not is because you can't get from the truth value of A to the truth value of it's possible that A or it's necessary that A. These modalities aren't truth functional. They're not extensional. That means we can't get to the truth value of it's possible that A or it's necessary that A just by looking at the truth value of A. These logics are intentional, okay? Not intentional with a T, but intentional with an S in contrast to extensional. So just by knowing the truth value of A doesn't tell us whether A is possible or necessary. So those modalities, possible or necessary, they're what's called alethic modalities, okay, to do with truth. So it's like they are ways of modifying the truth of a sentence, not just saying true or false, but possibly true or possibly false. Other kinds of modalities, we've got temporal modality. So we could think about the past and say sometime in the past, it was the case that A, or always in the past, it was the case that A. Or thinking about the future, we can say it's always going to be the case that A, or at some point in the future, it will be the case that A. So these are the temporal modalities. We've also got epistemic modalities, okay, having to do with knowledge. So being able to say that this agent, or I know that A, or I believe that A, that's what you would call a doxastic modality to do with belief. And then we've also got dynamic modalities, modalities concerning change. So these come up in logics where maybe we're reasoning about how a computer executes a program and we could say something like, well, at some run of the program, it's going to get to this bad state where it gets in a loop, let's say, or every run of the program will take us to a good terminating state or whatever. So lots of different applications of modal logics. We're going to be looking at the basics of modal logic, the basic way of doing semantics that applies to all of these. And for each of these different kinds of modal logics, basically, we just tweak it a little bit for whichever application we have in mind. So, for instance, if we're thinking about a doxastic modality, I believe that A, we don't want it to be the case that that entails that A is true. Whereas if we're doing epistemic modality, we do want it to entail that A is true. OK, so if I know something, if I know that A, we want A to be true because you can only know what's true. But you can believe false things. So one difference between doxastic belief and epistemic knowledge modality is that the epistemic case, we want what you know to be true, not so for doxastic modality belief. And we can do that just by tweaking how our semantics works. 
Okay, so I'm going to show you all these little tweaks. We are going to, for the most part, focus on the alethic modalities, possible and necessary. These are the ones that probably come up the most in philosophy. A word of caution, however, sometimes when we do modal logic, it's best not to interpret it in Anyway, OK, so forget the alethic or the epistemic or the temporal interpretations and just take the logic on its own terms. That way, we don't read more into the symbols than really should be there. OK, so we're going to look at the modalities. We're going to look at two. One is going to be written as a box and one is going to be written as a diamond. And sometimes it's best not to read them as anything. OK, just say box, just say diamond. And that way we don't kind of put more of our own views about how necessity or knowledge or whatever should behave. And we only look at what's in the logic. Let's start off with the modal language. This is really simple. So we're going to take the propositional language that we've seen in previous videos and we're going to add to it modalities so that we can do modal logic. OK, so the propositional language, we've got these primitive sentence letters, P, Q and R, and then we can put them together with our connectives. So negation and or if then and if and only if we can use those to make complex sentences. And then we add two new bits. We've got a box and a diamond. And syntactically, these work a little bit like the negation. That is, you can bung them in front of a sentence and you get a new sentence. So you take any sentence and you put a box or a diamond in front of it and that gives you a new sentence. Here's one example. So here I took P and I put a diamond in front of it to give me diamond P. I took Q and put a box in front of it to give me box Q. I conjoined them together with and and then I put another box in front of it. So if we think about the syntax tree for that sentence, draw it out, what would it look like? There's the main connective right at the top. Next one is and, that branch is left and right, and we've got a diamond followed by a P on the left and a box followed by a Q on the right. So there's one example of a modal logic sentence. Here's another one. We've got diamond P over this side. We've got box Q or R over that side, all put together with an arrow. So looking at the syntax tree for that one, main connective is the if then, the arrow. On the left of that, there's a diamond and then a P. On the right of that, there's a box and then the or, and that branch is left and right with a Q on the left and the R on the right. OK, so there's the modal language, pretty straightforward. Let's have a look at how we do semantics for modal logic. So in the next video, I'm going to go into modal semantics in detail. So for now, we're just going to have a really quick overview. Semantics for modal logic is given by relational semantics. OK, what's relational semantics? It's some bits, some blobs or whatever with a relation between them. OK, so that's going to look a bit like this. It's the kind of thing we've already seen in first order logic. We have some things and we've got some arrows going between them. The difference here is we're now not thinking about these things as real world entities like you or me. We're now thinking of them as different possible scenarios. Different logicians call these different things. They call them states, they call them points, they call them scenarios, situations, possible worlds. It doesn't really matter. Nothing is going to hang on that from a logical point of view. Let's just call them possible worlds. So we've got some possible worlds and we've got a relation between them. We can give them names. I've done that here in blue. So there's state or possible world one. There's number two. There's number three, four, five and six. Giving them names is useful because that allows us to identify them and talk in an easy way about what's true where. And finally, we're going to label these worlds with primitive sentence letters, P, Q's and R's. OK, so that might go like this. So in this world, P and Q are both true. In that one, S3, only P is true. And here, only Q is true. This is one where neither of them are true. OK, so what we do is if a primitive sentence letter is true at a world, we write it there. And if it's not true at that world, we just leave it off. OK, so we label them with the primitive sentence letters that are true at those worlds. This is essentially the valuation function that we saw in propositional logic. But now it's not just telling us that this sentence is true and this sentence is false, like it did in propositional logic. It's saying this sentence is true, say, at this world, but it's not true at that world. And here we meet one of the key points in modal logic. 
we can't now simply say this sentence is true, this sentence is false, because we've got different possible worlds in play, okay? These are like different ways things could have turned out, different versions of reality. So now we're not saying it's true or it's false, we're saying in this version of reality, it's true, but in that version of reality, it's false. In this possible world, it's true, but in that possible world, it's false. So, truth in modal logic is relative to a model, one of these, just like it is in first order logic, but it's also relative to a world in that model. Okay, so we're going to say in this model, P is true there, but it's false there. So there's always going to be two parameters to take into account when we're talking about whether a sentence is true or false. There's the model that we're looking at, but there is also where in that model we're talking about, okay? Which world are we talking about? Is the sentence true there, but false there? We're then going to use these relational models to make sense of the box and the diamond. And basically what they mean is really straightforward. The diamond means I can follow an arrow and get to some world where whatever is true. So diamond A means I can get to a world where A is true. Box A means Every world I can get to, A is true there, okay? When I'm talking about getting to a world, I mean by following one arrow. So what we're going to do is imagine that you are standing at one of these worlds or one of these points, and the arrows show you where you can see, okay? So from here, I can see there and there, but I can't see here or here or here, and I can't see there. I'm talking about follow an arrow, okay? So from here, I can see here and here, and then we say... What does the diamond mean? Well, it means I can see somewhere. Okay, so diamond A means I can see somewhere and A's true there. Box A means everywhere I can see from where I currently am, A's true. Let's just have a look at how that works in practice. Let's suppose we're at world five, S5, okay? What's going to be true there? Well, there is a state that I can get to, this one here, where Q's true. So diamond Q will be true here. Also, Everywhere I can get to by following an arrow, a P is true. So box P is going to be true there. OK, so at S5, diamond Q and box P are both true. What about state S1? OK, so from there I can get to itself because it's got this little loop on it. I can get to S2 and I can get to S5. Is there anything that's true at all of those? Well, Q is true here and Q is true here, but Q isn't true here. However, there is something that's true at all of them, which is Q or diamond Q. That's because we've got this principle from propositional logic that if something is true, like A, then A or B is true. So here, Q's true, therefore Q or diamond Q is true. Here, Q is true, so again, Q or diamond Q is true. And here, diamond Q is true, so Q or diamond Q. Q is true. <laughs> so if we're standing at world S1, what holds at every world we can see? Box Q or diamond Q. So this is the way that we can go through uh, sentences bit by bit and work out whether they're true or false in one of these relational models. That's basically all we're doing when we're considering modal logic. Okay, guys, thank you for listening this far. That is it for this super short introduction to modal logic. In the next video in the series, we are going to be diving deeper into semantics for modal logic. We're going to be looking at relational models in more detail and seeing some of the fun things we can do with them. If you've enjoyed the video, why don't you subscribe to the channel? I would really appreciate it. If you've got questions on this stuff, leave me a comment below. Thank you very much for listening. I will see you next time.